morning we'll be <clears throat> turning to 2 Kings. We'll start in the first verse and we'll read through the 18th verse. We've been with Elijah for quite some time and this will be our last time with Elijah. As Elijah is taken from the scene and Elisha will take his place. And you can find the beginning of our reading on page 570 in the Pew Bible ahead of you. And we'll start reading after we pray. Lord, when the disciples deserted your son, he asked them, will you, will you leave me too? And they said, to where will we go? You have the words of life. And indeed, you have the words of life. Where else should we go except to your word? So, Lord, give life. Don't give empty words, but give life today through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. And if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho, who were watching, said the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to greet him, to meet him, and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have fifty able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So he said, send them. And they sent fifty young men who searched for three days but did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, Didn't I tell you not to go? There are really no secrets in the passage, are there? We know from the very first verse exactly what's 
going to happen. This is a, a spoiler of spoilers. The, the whole story is going to revolve around Elijah being taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. But just because there's no secrets doesn't mean there's no drama or no tension. Because as we go along here, it seems that everybody knows what's going to happen to Elijah. Everybody knows. The prophets know. Elijah knows. Elijah knows. Everybody knows. But people don't know how or when or where. They just know that it's going to happen. And Elisha doesn't have to like it, even though he knows that it's going to happen. And the, it's kind of a, a travel story, if you will. They're leaving Gilgal. They're going to, to Bethel, and they're having this conversation. Elijah tries to shoo Elisha away, and Elisha says, no, 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 no. I am staying with you. I don't care how much you want me to leave or how afraid of my well-being you are that I would see you when you leave and be full of grief. I am sticking with you. So they go off to Bethel. Now you might remember Bethel from a number of chapters ago. Bethel was the southernmost point in the northern empire, in the northern kingdom, okay? Southernmost point in the northern kingdom. And when Jeroboam, who was the first king of the northern kingdom, became king, he didn't want his people going off to Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, to worship, lest they decide they wanted to go back to that kingdom. And so he built two golden calves and set them up, one in the south and one in the north, and the southern one was in the city of Bethel. And this is a cult center. But even so, as Elijah and Elisha come to Bethel, there's a company of prophets there. There are still people in this, in this town of paganism, there are still people who love and worship the Lord who live there. And there we see again that he, Elijah tries to shoo away Elisha, and Elisha says, I'm not going anywhere. And these prophets, they come, and they say to Elisha, Elisha, don't you know what's going to happen? He says, yes, I know about it, but he has no interest in talking about it. So off they go to the next place. Off they go to Jericho. You We'll probably remember Jericho as being the city, the, the first city, the fortified city that the Israelites come to after they wander through the wilderness. And it's a large city and the Israelites are afraid, but it's the city the Lord has them march around all those days and all that time. And then the last day, they march around the seven times, they blow the trumpet, they crash the pots, and the Lord causes the walls to come down and the Israelites go in and and destroy the city. Well, that's where this happens. They're on their way to Jericho, and it's the, the same story. Different place, but same story, right? They, they come through there. The prophets come out, and they say, to, they say to Elisha, don't you know what's going to happen? And Elisha says, I know, but I don't want to talk about it. What we see here is a dynamic character. Elisha is, is no two-dimensional cookie-cutter prophet. Elisha has deep intensity. Elisha is a man of grief. He is a man of insistence. He is, he is a real man with a, a full range of emotions. Now, now put yourself in Elisha's shoes. Remember that Elisha had been a, a rather wealthy man. He had four plows and four team of oxen, which puts you in the upper strata of society at the time, and he had enough fields that he would need four plows and four oxen. And then suddenly one day, Elijah the prophet, the great prophet, comes, tosses his cloak over Elisha and calls him to follow him. And Elisha breaks up the plows, starts them on fire, sacrifices the oxen, sacrifices them on the fire, and leaves everything to follow Elijah. And as far as monetary value and status in society, Elisha leaves more behind to follow Elijah than most of the disciples left behind to follow Jesus. But now, now what? The man he left everything to follow is going to be gone. Elisha is going to be left alone. So what now for him, but also what now, what now for Israel? 
Elijah was the great prophet. He was the great hope in Israel. Now he is going to be gone as well. E Elisha has grief over his mentor leaving, and it seems like the grief would be justified. But then we see, after we come through, after we come through Jericho, they go down to the Jordan River. And a bunch of the prophets follow along. You wonder why they follow along. Perhaps they just wanted to see the fireworks, so to speak. They want to see Elijah. They want to see how it's going to happen. And so they, they follow and they stand at a distance. And Elijah and Elisha come up to the river. And the prophets probably think, well, certainly this is where it's going to happen. I mean, where can they go from here, right? They're, they're right next to the river. They can't go across the river, certainly. So this must be where it's going to happen. But of course, a river or a sea is no obstacle for our God. And so Elijah rolls up his cloak, which is a sign of his office as prophet. He takes it and he slaps the water with it. We pick up the story there in, in verse 8. In verse 8 we read, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. He just hits the water with a cloak. The cloak is sort of like a, a really warm cape. It would be used to keep you warm at night when you were sleeping. It was sort of like a, a coat. And so this is a sign of his prophetic office. This is the thing that marks Elijah out from other people. This, this says that he is a man of God. And as he does this, the river parts one side to another. Now that in and of itself is incredible. Right, that you could just slap a body of water with a coat and all of a sudden this mighty river that flows from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea uh, has a great drop so there's a high water volume going through it. All of a sudden, poof! One side and the other there's water but then between there is dry ground. But beyond just the, the significance of the incredible miracle in and of itself, behind that as well you have but there's a deeper meaning to this. And who else would part a great body of water but Moses? Right? Moses comes to the Red Sea, and the Israelites are pinned between the sea and Pharaoh's army, and the Lord, through Moses, parts the Red Sea, and the people walk through. And it's no accident that one of Elijah's, or actually Elijah's last miracle, represents one of the miracles God did through Moses. Here we see that again, the author has taken pains to show us that Elijah is a prophet like Moses. That this is a great man. And of course, we know that he's a great man because he and Moses are the two men who appear with Jesus in the glory of the transfiguration and talk with Jesus in his glory. Now, if that's not an honor of honors, I don't know what is. Right? If, if being able to talk to Jesus in the most glorious moment of his human life, isn't an honor, I don't know what is. So they pass through the river on dry ground. But remember, there's another time, another body of water is parted, and it's not the Red Sea, but it's actually the Jordan River. And it's at this very point, this very place, right across from Jericho, that the Jordan River is parted. If you can recall the the series of events, the Israelites had come out of Egypt, they'd crossed the Red Sea, they were free, and they were on their way, they were on their way to Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. And they sent 12 spies into the land to find out, well, what's it like? Is it everything God said it was going to be? And the spies come back and they say, it's everything God said it was going to be and more. And everybody's excited and they say, but we've got some bad news. There's giants in the land and they don't like us very much. Only two spies said it was good, good to go in, Caleb and Joshua. The rest said, don't go in. So the people say, we're not going in. And the Lord says, that's okay. None of you are going to live. Your children will go in. So they wander the wilderness for 40 years, and as they do, they finally get to the end, and Moses dies outside the promised land, and Joshua becomes the leader of the Israelites, and they come up to the Jordan River going the other way, going into the promised land. The Jordan River is at flood stage, now what will they do? Well, Joshua says to the priest who carried the Ark 
of the covenant on poles. He says, go, take the ark and step into the river. And as soon as the ark enters into the river, the Jordan River stops and opens. And the people walk through at this very point, the people walk through on dry ground. Now the ark of the covenant was the sign of the presence of God. God was present with his people in the ark. And so when Elijah takes the cloak and slaps the water with it and the water parts, it means that God is present with his people in the prophet Elijah. That Elijah is a presence of God. Not that he is God, but he is the presence of God. God's power, God's word is in him. So Elijah is indeed a great man. But then we see that Elijah and Elisha go off on their own. They cross the river, they go off on their own. And we see that Elisha's perseverance is rewarded. The first half of verse 9, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? This is a, a fun game. Right? I've used this I've used this game to pass time on long road trips. If you had one wish, what would you wish for? And you can't wish for more wishes. Hey, one wish. You can occupy a whole bunch of time thinking about what you would wish for. So the prophet Elijah says to Elisha, you get, you get one thing, you can ask for one thing before I leave. What should it be? Solomon, in his, in his youthful humility, was asked the same thing. The Lord said to Solomon, what do you want? Solomon asked for wisdom. So what will Elisha ask for? Will he too ask for something wise? He says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. He asks for a double portion. This doesn't mean that he asks to be twice as great as Elijah. What it means is that he wants the, the older son's share. When, when you were dividing up an inheritance, the oldest son, as it should be, got two portions, and the rest of the sons got one portion. And so Elisha wants to be the older son of Elijah. He doesn't want to just be any prophet. He wants to be the next great prophet. He wants to carry on the ministry of Elijah with the power of Elijah. And this seems to maybe take Elijah by surprise. Perhaps not, but it seems maybe it has taken him surprise because he gives this answer in verse 10. You have asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. It's a difficult thing. It's a hard thing. I think it's a hard thing for two reasons. It's, it's a hard reason first because Elijah can't give what he's asked for. Elijah doesn't get to choose who receives the Spirit. The Spirit goes wherever he wishes. Elijah can't guarantee that this request is going to be granted. So it's a hard request in that way. It's a hard request in a different way because Elijah's ministry was hard. Remember, this is the same prophet who had gone off into the wilderness and asked God that he might die rather than go on in his ministry. This is the same prophet who had to go off and hide in the wilderness and be fed by birds because kings and queens were hunting him. This is the guy whose name was plastered on, on every light pole and on every door. Israel's most wanted. This is the guy who had to flee from Jezebel for a ton of times. This is the guy who had to go off to outside the country to be sustained in his life by a, a widow who had a jar with a miraculous portion every day, a flower and a flask of never-ending oil. This was a hard ministry. And Elijah has asked for a very Elijah has asked Elijah for a very hard thing. Now it's a good thing, but it's a hard thing. That's often the way it is, isn't it? Good things are not often easy things. Good things are often hard things. But it doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. So Elisha's request was a good one. And Elijah says, 
If you see me when I'm taken, if you see me when I'm taken, you will receive what you have asked for. Otherwise not. This is kind of an all or nothing. If Elisha, if Elisha doesn't get it, he's plowless, he's oxenless, he's mentorless, and he's going to have to find his own way back across the river. And so we see what happens then. We see what happens then in verse 11. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. There are very few verses in the Bible that can compete with this one for drama. Right? It's just one verse, but if you could see it, I imagine it would be great. I, I, you can only picture it in your mind's eye. You're, you're welcome to picture it however you want. This is how I picture it. I picture Elijah and Elisha walking together, talking, having this conversation. Elisha's trying to soak up all of his last moments with his mentor, and all of a sudden, boom, comes a horses, a horses of fire and a chariot of fire. And the first horse that comes through bumps Elisha out of the way, then thunders this chariot, and the dry driver grabs Elijah by his arm, whips him into the chariot, away they go, and suddenly a whirlwind carries the whole company up into heaven. The only thing that comes back is the cloak floating back to the ground. Isn't that incredible? I mean, just marvel at it for its own sake. It's incredible. But it's incredible beyond just its own sake. It's incredible because Elijah never dies. Elijah never dies. It's a pretty small club of guys who never die. It's a two-person club. Right? And the, the two people don't include Adam or Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, not, not David, not Elisha, not even the Lord Jesus belongs to this club. Just two guys, Enoch and Elijah. Two guys who never died because they were taken to heaven. One man says, Elijah was the second man that leaped the ditch where all the rest of mankind fell. There's a lot of hope there. There's a lot of hope there that even in the midst of a world full of death, isn't that full of kings? Kings is full of death, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died. This king lived, and then he died. This king killed a whole bunch of people, and then he died. You have the prophets of Baal being slaughtered. You have the prophets being killed by Jezebel. Death everywhere. And suddenly, in the middle of it, you have a guy who doesn't die. There's hope that even in the midst of a world filled with death, God still has power over death. That's hope. And that's what we need. That's hope for us. The hope for us is not that we're going to get whisked into heaven by a fiery chariot. Anybody else would like that? I would like that. Right, that's the odds are pretty slim, maybe two out of 25 billion, okay? Not very good odds. But the hope for us is found in that God still holds the power over death. And what did those two guys have in common? We know almost nothing about Enoch. We know that he was born, we know that he lived 365 years, and we know this one thing, it says Enoch walked with God and then he was no more. He walked with God. Elijah walked with God. Who does Elijah talk to all the time he talks to God? Everywhere Elijah goes, there is God. Elijah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. And in walking with God, there is life. Another man said, Man was born not to die. Man was born to live. 
and sin ruins it, and God's grace restores it. And God's grace restores the promise of life for those who walk before him. If you're familiar with, if you're familiar with uh, Ligonier Ministries or, or Table Talk, you might be familiar with the, the Latin phrase quorum Deo, which means in the presence of God, before the face of God. That's the kind of life lived which is re- rewarded with life eternal. The one who walks, who lives in the presence of God. Walking with God leads to life. And we walk with God by faith. The old dead reformed theologian Gerhardus Voss says, where communion with God has been restored, their deliverance from death is bound to follow. So it was with Enoch and Elijah. And so it will be for us if we walk with God in faith. But even though Elisha got to see what we would have, I I suspect, loved to see, he still has a devastated cry. He cries out in verse 12, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel... And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. The chariots and the horsemen, I, I, don't, think, I don't think he means the actual fiery chariot and fiery horsemen that have come by. He means Elijah. Elijah had been the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Elijah had been the defender of the people of God. When the, when the people of God, when their enemies came and, and threatened to crush them entirely, it was Elijah. It was Elijah who saved them. It was Elijah who proclaimed the Lord will destroy Israel's enemies. It was Elijah who protected the prophets. It was Elijah who offered security to the people of God. It was Elijah who destroyed the prophets of Baal. Elijah was, as it was said, worth more than a hundred companies of troops and more than a hundred divisions of chariots. And now he's gone. What will happen now? What will happen to Elisha? What will happen to the prophets? What will happen to the, the rest of the church that endures in the time of Israel? Some of you are old enough to have lived through the Cold War. Others of us will mostly have read about it. One of my first memories is sitting on, in my parents' living room on the old 80s, 90s burnt orange carpet Watching the, watching the television and seeing these people chopping down this concrete wall and having a really hard time knowing why they could get such joy destroying a concrete barrier. Well, it was the Berlin Wall. It signaled the end of the Cold War. The Cold, the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union built up these huge arsenals of nuclear weapons one trying to outdo the other, always living in the balance, and the world sat as it was on the edge of its seat. Because any one move, anybody pushes a button on either side, and the whole world seemingly would be demolished. People used to have nuclear fallout drills, like we have fire drills. Dug fallout shelters in their homes and underneath their businesses. But there was one thing There was one thing that kept the world from destroying itself, it seemed, and that was a a simple doctrine called MAD. Very appropriate, isn't it? MAD. Mutually Assured Destruction. And it was really a big big boy's version of the old schoolyard saying, if you hit me, I'll hit you back. You launch your missiles, I'll launch mine, and we'll both die. That was how the world was kept from destroying itself. What if you woke up and you heard on the news that your entire nation's arsenal was gone. No longer, no longer was there any defense. You would feel vulnerable. A sense of national nakedness. You would feel like Elisha felt right then. Who will protect us? There's no one left to save us. And so Elisha cries out, in his grief, 
Who will protect us? And the answer is given in the next two verses, verses 13 and 14. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. All that's left of Elijah is the cloak. The sign of his prophetic ministry. And Elijah, Elisha goes and picks it up. And what does he do? He rolls it up. He has a cry of grief. He cries out to the Lord. And he slaps the water with it and the water parts. Elijah's last, Elijah's last miracle is Elisha's first. That's significant. Because right where Elijah leaves off, Elisha picks up. Elijah's gone, but God is not gone. God's presence, God's power, God's preservation doesn't miss a beat. Elisha is fine because God is with him. Israel is fine because God is with him. God has not left his people. God never leaves his people. And that was true with the Lord Jesus as well, wasn't it? He gives the great commission and he ends it with, Surely I am with you even to the end of the age. Jesus goes away. How much more devastating than Elijah. Jesus goes away, but he has not left us without hope. But he sends his spirit. And he empowers his church with his power, with his preservation, even to the end of the age. God never leaves his people. Not in the days of Moses, not in the days of of Elijah, not in the days of Jesus, and not in the days now. God never leaves his people. Elisha feared, but he shouldn't have. We shouldn't fear either. We should, as the prophet Isaiah heard from the Lord, fear not, for I am with you. And if God is for us, Who can be against us? Fear not, for I am with you. That's a good promise. Let's pray. Father, you have not given in your providence in our age to part waters or send fiery chariots You have not given in our age to preach in the tongues of the the apostles and to see thousands converted. You have not given in our age that dead men come out of their graves. You did not give that in the age of Timothy or Titus either. You have not made us apostles. And even still, even still we see and know the wisdom and the power of God. And that you were at work in our time, as you were in the time of Moses, as you were in the time of Elijah, as you were in the time of the Lord and of the apostles, so you are with us today. That death does not have the final word, but life has the final word. And we ought not to fear, not even death itself, because you are with us in life and in death. We belong to you, and you will never forget your people. We praise you for this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.